We've been working through uh, a sermon series on, on worship. We just finished that up last week, and we've really been using this throne as a, as a symbol to represent God's presence in our service. You know, when we think about Jesus, it, sometimes we can tend to think about the benefits that come in Jesus' life because he's the Son of God, because he's the Savior of the world. He, he, he just has some of these things going on in his life that would make his life here on earth easier, right? I mean, just, just thinking about him, and we love our superheroes, right? If you had a superhero, Jesus would definitely be one of those. And, and, um, and we can think about Jesus as a superhero with special abilities and think about how cool it would be to be him. In fact, let's just brainstorm for just a second here. What are some of the abilities that Jesus has that he, ex- that he showed on earth that would be really cool if you could do that? Anyone? What was that? Healing. Healing. In fact, he could heal long distance, right? I mean, he didn't even have to be there to heal. Okay, that would be cool. Okay, love for all people. That is a super power, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Driving out demons. Yeah, that would be cool to have demons be afraid of you and, and run away. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, he raised people from the dead. That would be a pretty cool uh, special ability to have. Walking on water. Yeah, calming storms. That would be part of that. What was that? Yeah, he could feed... Yeah, he could multiply food and drink. I mean, how often could we use that? That would be cool. What was that? Seeing the future? Yeah, that would be a cool... I mean, he was a pretty good fisherman, right? Kind of knew where the fish were. Fishing without a pole. Yeah. Yeah, he, he, he himself came back to life. After being killed, yeah. Now, when you really get into all this thought process about Jesus, you can really um, get to the point where maybe you're only thinking about the good things that happened in his life, but there actually were some things that weren't so great that happened to him, right? You guys know that? There's some other things that happened. Where would Dusty go? Did you see him? Oh, there he is. Dusty was going to bring me hey. a cup of coffee i i didn't get my cup of coffee this morning i just made it for you <laughs> did you is it the good camp, camp coffee stuff or mm-hmm it's the kind you chew <laughs> the kind you chew yeah mm-hmm it it looks really good it it is good it, I, look, it looks a little more like sludge though well i drank the top part off because i was you really drank my coffee you got to make sure it's not poisoned or nothing. Oh, you're helping me. That's right. I did it for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you left me the bottom part of the can. That's cup. the best part. It holds your spoon up. Look, you can turn that thing upside down, and there's nothing. Like, there's nothing coming out of there. Yeah, well, thanks for the cup of coffee. Dusty. Yous are welcome, sir. <laughs> welcome. All right, I'm going to go get back to work. Hmm. I don't think I'm going to be drinking this. It needs a little warm-up. Anyway, we are actually on the third Sunday in the season of Lent. Now, when we talk about Lent, we're not talking about Lent that you get out of the dryer after a load, okay? Do you guys know what Lent, the season of Lent, is about? And I'm asking... Maybe some kids here. Any kids know what Lent's about? It's kind of a hard question. We don't talk about Lent a ton. but um, Early Christians felt like the Easter celebration, what, you know, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus and all that that means to us, which is a big deal to us, right? Having Jesus come back from the dead so that we could be forgiven of our sins. Um, that that really deserves some special preparation. That we shouldn't just jump right into the Easter season and and be ready for it. That really we should take our time and and work, be serious about getting ready for such an important time of year. And that's 
where Lent came, came about, the season of Lent. Um, as, as early as the second century, many Christians observed several days of fasting in preparation for Easter. And in fact, as, as it kind of moved along, we're now at 40 days of fasting, right? It's one of those numbers that we see a lot in the Bible. And this fasting during Lent serves as a reminder to reflect on our sin, on our shortcomings, the things, the, the actual why Jesus had to come. And, but also to, to, to focus on Jesus' sufferings for us, what he, was, what he had to go through in order to, so that we could experience forgiveness from our sin. So Lent becomes a special time of really self-examination, even repentance of whatever we might have um, our relationship, whatever struggle we might have in our relationship with God and make sure that we are right with God as we enter into the Easter season. Um, and so I want to encourage you this morning as we worship and really think about Lent, to, to not just think about the great benefits of being Jesus, but to also call, them, call to mind the, the parts of Jesus' life that were more bitter. And I kind of like this cup. It's got some pretty bitter grounds in the bottom of it. Can you see that? Can I do that without spilling it? Um, if you actually had to drink the whole cup, right, you'd actually get some good coffee. And if you had to stomach the rest of it, it would be pretty bitter. And unfortunately, Dusty took the good part, and all I've got left is the bad part. But that's kind of, you know, thinking about Jesus' life. There's an analogy here that I think is important. That there actually were some very bitter things that he had to experience in this life. Can you name some of those bitter ex experiences that he had? Persecution? Betrayal? Rejection? Death? Yeah, certainly. That would be a little bitter. What was that? Fear? Physical pain, yeah, he was tortured. Now, when I think of Jesus, you know, you, he obviously had the bullseye on his back, right? The devil didn't like him. The demons didn't like him. There's people who didn't like him. I mean, there's people who loved him, but there's also people who didn't like him. Any other bitter parts to be in Jesus? Okay, yeah, S people turning their back on him. I think one of the things that I would struggle when I think about Jesus' life is that, you know, he had the power to do anything, but he was limited in, in the use of that power if he actually wanted to follow the will of God. That would be very tough, to be a superhero with super abilities, but then not be able to use them every time. I think that would be interesting. You know, he was misunderstood, In fact, let me just take you through here uh, just a few, for a few moments. Look at a couple stories in Scripture. So just as we enter into worship this morning to, to meditate on some of the difficult things that, that Jesus went through. Matthew chapter 4. We see Jesus and his time in the wilderness, just right at the beginning of his ministry. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. That would have been a pretty bitter, hard time. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now think about this. He, he was Jesus, right? Could he have turned those rocks into bread? He could have. He could have taken care of the problem for himself, but yet... Yeah, he chose to follow God's will for his life. That would have been tough, 40 days and 40 nights without food. <laughs> Verse 5, Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, the devil said, throw, down, throw yourself down, for it's written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift, up, lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it, It's also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. 
Again, could he have commanded angels to protect him from that particular situation? He could have. But he chose not to. Verse 8, again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, the devil said, if you will bow down and worship me. Whose are the kingdoms of the world? God the Father, right? Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. Now what would you see as the biggest struggle in that passage of scripture for Jesus? What would be the bitter part of that experience? The most bitter, maybe. Okay. Being tempted to do what you knew you shouldn't do. Yeah. 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 I mean, one punch in the nose for the devil wouldn't be all that bad, right? Why not? You know, obviously going 40 days and 40 nights without food probably wouldn't have been the greatest <laughs> thing. I mean, it's pretty a pretty strong understatement to say that he was hungry, right? He was starving. He wanted food. Now, if it was you and I out there, um, there wouldn't be much temptation because there's just no food in the desert, but he could make food. This is Jesus. He could feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. He could have taken care of his problem, right? But he chose not to. I think that would even be harder than going through it without food. Really, all the temptations that you see in this story is really temptations of idolatry, as we've been talking about the last few weeks. He's being tempted to, to choose a different God, and that God being himself, instead of God the Father. It's kind of interesting. Jesus had the power to do whatever he wanted to do, but he would have to keep himself from doing those things in order to follow the will of God, right? I mean, would he worship the Lord God and serve him only when he had the power to take care of it himself? Would he trust him? Those would have been very bitter, bitter, bitter times for him. And again, I would say the same thing. Why not just pop the devil on the nose? I mean, he had the power to do that. That would have been great. But not the right thing to do, right? One other story that I'd point to that is found near the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 26. We find Jesus right before he was arrested. And in, he's meeting with his disciples and he knows what he's about to face. Matthew 26, beginning with verse 36, it says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He wanted them there. He needed their help, right? He needed to go and cry out to the Lord for help. Cry out to God in heaven to help him through this hard time. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Help me stay strong. Going a little far, farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. I mean, you see what's going on? Jesus is literally talking about a cup. And it's not a nice cup of coffee, is it? It's a bitter cup. A very bitter cup. What is that bitter cup? What is he talking about? Yeah, his death. His, his death that was coming. His death on the cross. So here Jesus is. He's the Son of God. He's a superhero. <laughs> and he can't use his powers, his special abilities, to keep himself from going on the cross. Now physically, could he have stopped them from putting him on the cross? Yeah, he could have. 
But this was part of the bitter cup that he was coming to drink. There was some bitterness of actually doing the will of God. Causing him pain. Ultimately death. Do you think that Jesus really experienced pain and bitterness in his life on earth? Yeah, he did. It says right there in scripture that he was full of sorrow, troubled. What Jesus had to endure for us is no small task. And that's what I would encourage us this morning as we worship, to consider the cost that Jesus has paid for us, for our freedom, for our forgiveness. Let's spend some time giving him credit, giving him the worship that he truly does deserve. Would you do that with me? Let's pray. Lord God, we do just thank you for sending your son Jesus to earth to take care of our problems. So thankful for Jesus and his willingness to come, his willingness to drink the bitter cup, to go through this process so that we could find forgiveness, so that we could find life. Lord, for these next few minutes, Lord, would you just help us to focus on all that, all that you've done for us? Help us to worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we, we've been focusing this morning on the, uh, the bitter drink. You guys can all, uh, you've all experienced that face, right? You guys know what that is? Yeah, the bitter drink. Focusing on what Jesus has done for us. The cost that he paid on our behalf. And we're so thankful for his willingness, aren't we? His willingness to drink the cup. But I think what's interesting is as you read through scripture, there's other people drinking the cup, not just Jesus. Did you know that? Jesus isn't the only one that drinks the bitter cup. In fact, one of those instances is found in Matthew again, Matthew chapter 20. And it's a, it's a story that involves the request of a mom on behalf of two of Jesus' disciples, or two sons. Matthew 20, verse 20, it says, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling down, asked a favor of Jesus. What is it that you want? Jesus asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking for, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. <laughs> they probably should have thought about that answer a little bit before they responded. At least asked, well, what is the cup? What's in the cup? Right? We can. Verse 23, Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from the cup, from my cup. But to sit on my right or left is not for me to grant. These places, they belong to those to whom they've been prepared by my Father. Doesn't this seem kind of like an odd conversation? At least it, it does to me. Here, here these disciples are. They've been traveling with Jesus for the last couple years, right? Everything's going good. And, and somewhere along the way in the conversation, they said, well, can't we be powerful in your kingdom? Won't you allow us to sit on your right and your left? And, and Jesus kind of says, well, you want to be in power in my kingdom, huh? Well, how about this? How about you drink my cup then? <laughs> it's kind of a rough transition there. Drink from my cup. Do you think back in the day when you were receiving Christ as your Lord and Savior, that if they would have told you you had to drink from his cup, do you think you would have done it? <laughs> if you had had the thought through that and said, drink from my cup if you want. If, I mean, we don't talk about those things, do we? I'm not so sure I would have said yes. Do I really want to drink from the cup of Jesus? Now, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. There's actually some great benefits that come along with following Jesus, right? 
Have you ever thought about that before? What are some of the benefits of following Jesus? Forgiveness. That's a great benefit. Any other benefits? Peace. Peace may be in the midst of our bitterness. <laughs> His Holy Spirit, great gift, great benefit. Anyone else? Strength. Joy. His presence in our life. Always being there for us. No one's mentioned heaven. <laughs> would heaven be a benefit? I would think so, anyway. <laughs> heaven would be a good benefit. Um, but you know, when I think about this scenario, you're, you're, you're talking about all these great benefits that come with following with Jesus, and then you still have this cup that's sitting here, right? I mean, I can almost see the conversation between a salesperson and, and someone trying to buy the product, right? Um, yeah, there's lots of great things that's involved in following Jesus, and then they're kind of doing this, right, with the cup. Everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be peachy. All you do is sign on the dotted line. So we, you know, we have to include a skit this morning. So we actually have a demonstration, maybe just a little bit of imagination involved in uh, a sales job for a relationship with Jesus. All right, so we have these great benefits, right? But also this cup, the fine print. So what is this cup? What's in it? When Jesus talks about cups, what is he talking about? Is he, is he talking about that we are going to be tortured and that we're going to die on the cross like he did? I hope not. Possibility. Yeah? And, I, and thankfully, we actually, in the Bible, there are actually, actually some hints about what's in this cup. So I'm just going to have you look at just a few passages this morning. There's lots more that we could cover in here, but just three passages. First, let's just look at the, begin, the ending of the story that we were just looking at with the, the mother and her two sons, um, two disciples that wanted to be great in the kingdom of God. Listen to how it ends, Matthew 20, verse 24. When the other ten disciples heard about this conversation, they were indignant. They were frustrated with the other two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles, they lorded over them, and their high officials, they exercised authority over them. They, they're power hungry, those Gentiles. They're horrible bosses. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, 
And whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus is, you know, this is all in context of the cup. Jesus is alluding to what's in the cup. So what does the cup look like according to this passage? A servant doing the will of God, right? Willing to be a ransom for many is in there. So serving others, being interested in them, okay? Another conversation that that Jesus was having with his disciples on the night that he was arrested that sounds an awful lot like this one in John chapter 13. Jesus has just washed his disciples' feet and then and then they move on to this conversation. And, and washing people's feet, that sounds a lot like serving, doesn't it? So kind of along the same lines. Verse 12, it says, When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and he returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. You also should be servants to others. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done. Drink my cup. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. You will be blessed if you drink my cup. You will be blessed if you drink the whole cup. Bitterness and all. So what does this cup look like according to John 13? Similar. Serving. Investing in others. What was that? Dirty feet. But there might be some bitterness in the serving. Yeah? Okay? Now we could look at a lot of different examples, but I just want to look at one more. Philippians chapter 2. Paul says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any sharing, any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, being of one mind. What's he saying? He's saying, drink my cup. Let's all drink the cup together. Everyone drink the (laughs) Kool-Aid. That wasn't in my sermon. I just thought of that. <laughs> yeah, thank goodness. <laughs> so what, is the, what does the cup look, what does drinking the cup look like? Verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Live in humility, right? Rather in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests. Sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? but each of you to the interest of the others, serving others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And what is that mindset? Well, he describes it. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He still had to drink the cup, didn't he? Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. He drank from the cup, even though he had the power to bypass the cup. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Can you see what we're called to to be as followers of Jesus? We're called to drink from his cup, which means to become servants of the will of God. To become servants of others. Now why would God want us to do that? Why would he want us to have the same mindset of Christ Jesus, for instance? To live our lives under the example of Jesus. Why would that be so important to him for us to serve and to love others? Is it so that we could be taken advantage of? (laughs) So that we could be picked on, persecuted, Is that why he wants us to do that? I don't think that that's really what God had in mind. And in fact, if 
If Jesus knew that there was bitterness in there, however, he would have still drank it, right? Even if someone else was taking advantage of him, I think God would want us to actually drink the whole cup. Not that he actually wanted the bitterness to be in there, but that he, in spite of the bitterness, would still want us to drink it anyway, even if it makes us uncomfortable. So why does he want us to drink possibly a bitter cup? Why do you want us to do that? It really comes down to the mission, doesn't it? the mission that God had to help people find their way back to God. God wants us to love others, to serve others, to be about others, not because it's a great way to live, although it is. It's really because God loves the people that we encounter in our lives. He loves the people that we work with, that we go to school with. He loves our neighbors. Everyone we encounter, wherever we are, he loves them. He wants them to experience all the great benefits that we've experienced in our relationship with him. He wants that for them. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life, right? Life with him. Jesus didn't come to the world to condemn the world. He came to to the world to save it right? And he has given us an opportunity to be a part of that plan. If we are willing to drink the cup. Even if there might be some bitterness in there. Even if we might be taken advantage of. Are you with me? So now the hard part. What do we do with with this cup? How do we apply this to our lives? Well, who is it that you struggle with to love? Who is the bitterness that's in this cup (laughs) in your life? I mean, it would be really easy to love those who love us back, but there are some in this world, just, just a few, that might cause some bitterness in our life, right? That wouldn't be as good tasting as others, right? And Jesus had those challenges, those challenging moments in life. What did he do? He went to his heavenly father and cried out for help. Can you help me to drink this cup? Not my will, but yours. I want to do this even though it makes me uncomfortable. Can you help me do this, Father? And that really should be our response, shouldn't it? When we're facing challenges. So this morning, we're going to close our service, actually, with a time of communion. And communion is an opportunity for us, again, to remember all that Jesus has suffered on our behalf. To bring us forgiveness. It's about thinking about the cup that he had to drink for us. And it's a time for us to express our thanks to him for being willing to serve, being willing to love, being willing to die so that we might have life. What's interesting, I think, is that if you think about the time of Jesus, that the juice that they would have been drinking wouldn't have been as refined as ours. Would have been probably a little more like homemade grape juice. Been a little pulpy, not as sweet, probably a little bitter. Do you think the bitterness was in the drink that they were actually drinking as he was talking about the blood that was spilled for them? His willingness to experience the bitterness? Would you be surprised if the juice was bitter? Think about that as we drink the drink. And what about the bread? His bread, the bread is a, an a symbol, is a symbol of his body broken for us, right? But who is the body of Christ now? We are. 
Could it be even in our communion elements that we're <laughs> actually expressing a brokenness that we have to go through in order to be a part of that body? To be a part of the mission that God has for us? To make a difference in our community? Part of the bitter cup that we get to experience as we experience life with Jesus. As the ushers come for communion, I would just encourage you to, to be thinking about where you are in all of this. Are you, are you really willing to trust God enough to drink the cup, the whole cup? To actually go through some uncomfortable places to get to be where God wants you to be. We're going to be distributing the elements this morning. If you'd like to come forward, we'd love to have you come forward as well. We can serve you at the altar as well. So just enter into a time of prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, we do just thank you again for, for this great plan that you have to save us, to bring forgiveness into the world, but that your plan would also include us. Jesus dying for us, but we get an opportunity to, to show the world Jesus through our lives by drinking a cup that sometimes is bitter. Lord, there are times that are just so sweet with you. As we spend time with you this morning, as we experience these elements, would you help us to think about the bitterness that came into your life because of our actions, because of our sin? Would you help us to think about your body that was broken so that we could be saved? And maybe our willingness to, to be broken ourselves so that we can help others to experience that same forgiveness. Allow us to experience your presence this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.